Hi, this is Bob Papa, voice of the New York football giants. And this is the Big Blue UK and Ireland podcast. Welcome back, Giants fans, to this new series, and please welcome my guest for this episode. She is New York Giant fan, go on X, and diehard Giants fan. It is uh, Adriana Iafola. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Thanks for having me. No, we are good. Thank you for coming on. We were just talking before about how, you know, we've we've followed your stuff for a while, and we appreciate what you do at Training Camp, keeping us in the loop and with all the other different content creators, so thanks for coming on. Um, now... This is a brand new series that we're doing with fans, content creators, uh, and more. So normally we have five questions. Uh, I've upgraded it to kind of five-ish. Oh, my camera has just disappeared there. Um, I've upgraded it to five-ish um, questions just because we do have um, the preseason going on right now. So with the preseason going on, uh, it kind of makes sense to, to speak about Daniel Jones as well. <laughs> Definitely. Right. So first of all, um, how long have you followed the Giants? Uh, has it been since birth? Uh, and why did you start? Yes. Um, I always joke around because my grandfather was a giant season ticket holder. I grew up in northern New Jersey. So uh, my town was really split between Giants and Jets fans. And I always say that, like, thank God my grandpa was a Giants fan because it could have been way worse. So he was a season ticket holder. He took my mom to games, my uncle. I have three brothers. My dad's a Giants fan. So, like, the whole family is uh, is really into the Giants, some of us more so than others. Fantastic. So literally family connection and, and kind of away it goes then. Yes. Yeah, there is yeah. no, um, no, if the Giants are having a bad year, I'm going to root for another team. It doesn't work like that. <laughs> Not for us. It doesn't work for us over here like that either. So <laughs> that's how it I should think... be. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, absolutely. We we have an epidemic of that with the, um, soccer over here where a lot mm -hmm. of people will have like a local team and then they'll have their favourite team, which are normally a team doing well. Um, a bit different because we have about 92 plus teams. So, you know, there's plenty to choose from. <laughs> a lot of options, which is nice. Yeah. So um, before we sort of talk about the current season and preseason so far, how do you how do we sum up last season? Like, How, how do you go about summing up what happened? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think it was bad luck with the injuries. I genuinely believe that if the injuries to Andrew Thomas, Jones, Saquon and um, Waller and whoever else got injured that it would have been a completely different season i don't think they would have won 12 games and went to the playoffs but i just think that if they all were healthy they would have won more than six games and we would have seen better giants football play week in and week out and i just think that that string of injuries was bad luck and uh ruined things for us it started early right like Andrew Thomas pretty much went down within the first five minutes and, and it, you could just see it start to unravel a little bit straight away. Mm -hmm. All downhill from there, unfortunately. <laughs> um, so obviously the Giants were on hard knocks. Um, a little bit easier to watch in America than it was over here, but we managed to do it. Um, what do you think your major takeaways were from hard knocks? Ooh, that's a good question. Um I, I feel like I kind of knew this already, but I think this is a big takeaway for a lot of fans is that John Mara does not run the show when it comes to drafting players, bringing in players from free agency, how, you know, the coaches are going to do their job. I think that for a long time, there's been this big misconception that John Mara sat down and said, we're giving Daniel Jones $160 million. I don't care what you guys say. I like him. I think we messed it up. And this is how things are going to go. And I think on Hard Knocks, we really got to see that that's not how it works at all. Joe Shane has been running the show since he's been here. And listen, maybe when Gettleman was the GM, things were different, but I just really 
thought that that was an important takeaway that, listen, if you want to blame anyone for the Jones deal or whatever your complaints are, take it up with Joe Shane because he's the one who is really making final decisions here. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we saw Mara a few times throughout the series. Um, he wasn't exactly a mainstay in the series, but from what, when we did see, he would put, provide input, which he's well within his rights to do as an owner. I mean, he's bankrolling the whole thing pretty much. So, um, But Joe Shane had final say. Otherwise, Saquon Barkley would probably still be here. Yep, exactly. So there were a lot of funny moments and a lot of kind of heartfelt moments I felt it in the entire series was there anything that stood out as like a favorite to you from from a, a non-football perspective maybe one thing that I thought was really sweet was on Dable's birthday all of them facetiming him I don't it seems like he was allowed to have the day off or something but the fact that they you know on his day off or whatever they're all in the building doing whatever they need to do Dable's just with his cigar and his kids just enjoying time in the pool um to me that and the dinner that they showcased of um the scouts in the combine those two things really made me feel like there's a lot of synergy in the building and everyone is on the same page and people really like each other and are good about communicating. And I think mm. this is also something that came out, you know, with the wink thing last year with what happened with him and Dable and also with judge and Gettleman was there was so much concern about people in the building and like, the hatred and anger and frustrations toward each other. We didn't see any of that. So I, I love to really see the camaraderie and the fact that they really seem like a team and everyone is in sync with each other. And on the same page made me feel like, Oh, we're in good hands here. Okay. I think they got it figured out a little bit. Yes. It's interesting. You, you touch on that, that dinner for the scouts. Cause I think you're probably the first person who's mentioned that out of the interviews we've done so far, but oh. I think, it, it's it's quite an important piece to understanding not only what you know who the scouts are and what they do but obviously who they are as people as well and, and in a kind of like a, a slightly more relaxed setting you get a little bit more from them yep um two preseason games have gone so far at the time of recording um <laughs> they've been interesting to say the least uh yes. what what are your thoughts so far on what we've seen Okay, so there are some good things. I feel really good about our wide receiver group and our running back group. And I felt like going into preseason and training camp that those were two of the stronger position groups on the team. But after seeing them play and seeing the depth there, I, I feel very confident in them. I also feel way better about the offensive line than I ever thought that I would feel at this point. So... I think that's something that we should be excited about. And, you know, I think there's so much negativity, like the people who are like, oh, well, they weren't even going against the Texans' best defensive players and they were going against the twos. Okay, what's your point? If you've watched any Giants football for the last decade, or if you haven't watched that much and you watched last season, we had to play multiple second string offensive linemen who were atrocious, who couldn't do anything. It was like they shouldn't have even been on the field because them standing there was useless. So the fact that we're – John Michael Schmitz has missed so much time in practice and only got a few snaps during the game. Um, the fact that we're missing John Runyon Jr., but Aaron Stinney has managed to stick – uh, has managed to hold up quite well over there. I think we should op be optimistic about the O-line and the more reps that they are going to get together, they should only be better. So I feel good about all of those areas. I feel good about the defensive line. It's a bummer that it, Ryder Anderson is gone, but you can't not be excited about Elijah Chapman. So yeah. I feel good about that aspect of things. And honestly, I, I feel pretty good about the linebackers. My biggest concerns coming out of it is obviously the quarterbacks and – the secondary. And I hope that after this weekend, those are alleviated a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. But I do believe that the second cornerback outside of Tay Banks is not on the roster yet. And I think they'll bring in someone once cuts are made. And 
listen, I am one of those people that I don't think Daniel Jones is the best quarterback in the world. I don't think he's the worst quarterback in the world. Um, I think that he had a really tough first quarter and made some really awful mistakes, but I felt like the way he turned it around in the second quarter gave me a little bit of faith that if he throws an interception or if he fumbles the ball or if he makes bad decisions like that, it's not getting in his head and then he can't get out of it. So like, I think with Jones, that's the one thing that I feel a little bit better about. Um, I wasn't expecting it to be as bad as it was, to be honest, <laughs> but you know, it was his first game back. I, I really believe that he has to play on Saturday against the Jets. I, if he doesn't play Saturday, I will feel not great about him starting against the Vikings. I just feel like he needs more reps. Yeah. Just two, three series. And yeah. That's enough. Yes, exactly. Especially if John Michael Schmitz is getting more reps, like let the offensive line get a couple more together, whether or not the Jets first team defense plays reps in a live game are better than no reps. So I just feel like it's better. I feel like maybe, you know, Jones can kind of get back some of that confidence that he was missing and hopefully instill it in the fan base too. Yeah. And obviously, you know, it's a brand new offensive line pretty much from top to bottom outside of Smith's yeah. in the middle and, the, and then Thomas on the left. So he's still building a bit of camaraderie and a bit of commun and communication with the other guys. So he's probably okay. still thinking this is last year's offensive line mentally. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's one thing that I said too, which uh, people are like, you're making excuses for Jones. I'm like, I'm not though. Like you have to understand what happened last year the offensive line being historically ba bad, he has been sacked more than probably any other quarterback. If not, he's in the top three for his last five years. So I also feel like during that game, he wasn't able to trust his eyes to see the clean pocket because for so long he hasn't had that. So that's one thing that I really want to see. Hopefully he plays on Saturday is that, when the offensive line is blocking, he trusts them and says, okay, mm -hmm. I can settle down in the pocket because I have more than a quarter of a second to see what's going on and to get rid of the ball. And then obviously you mentioned about the cornerback position. We were almost in the same spot like two years ago and we obviously picked up Nick McLeod, who's on the, on the kind of fringes at the moment. So it's not unheard of that there'll be somebody out there on, on waiver day. And there's plenty of veterans that will probably shake out as it stands as well. Yeah. And the Giants are number six in waiver claims. Mm. So they're going to have the opportunity too to bring in someone better than, you know, maybe like a Fabian Moreau or a Nick McLeod that they brought in over the last couple of years. Yeah, exactly. So without giving a prediction, because that comes later, uh, expectations and hopes for this season. Um, my hope is that everyone stays healthy, at least the bulk of the starters. Like I can't, I'm going to be so sad if we go through another year where we lose some of our star players and, mm. you know, it's been tough with preseason and camp. It happens, but so far, knock on wood, we have managed to dodge some bullets. So I just hope it stays like that. If we miss someone for a couple weeks, but they get back in, it's the nature of the game. Um, my expectation is is that we see above average play across the board. So offensive line, quarterback, running back, wide receivers, like I want to see it from every position group. They have to be better than they were last year, but they have to take it a step further. Like for a lot of guys like Kayvon and McFadden and some of those younger guys, you're in your third year now, you have to pick it up. It's time. Yep, absolutely. Um, so if we look at the draft and free agency and the players that we picked up through both of those, and this might be an obvious answer, and if it is, just please just give the obvious answer. <laughs> Who's going to make the biggest impact this season for the Giants? Um, I, I'm i going to pick Theo Johnson because I know, obviously, Burns is probably going to be the most impactful, but when you look at the offense and the struggles that they've had with the offensive line and blocking and things like that, Having someone like Theo Johnson, I think he's going to be what we all thought Waller was going to be, except he's a better blocker than Waller is. So I have high expectations for him, knowing that Dable loves tight ends. He loves Theo Johnson. He's big. He can block. He can catch. I think he's going to be a really big piece to this offense. I know everyone's excited about Neighbors and Burns, but we have to throw Theo in the mix because he was coming off an injury this spring and got – 
almost all of the reps with the ones. So I think it's fairly certain that we are going to see a lot of him. Um, and I think he's going to be really good. Genetic freak as well, isn't he? Just yes. literally every intangible you could want. And that's what I loved about, um, about hard knocks because when you get to the later rounds in the drafts, like, you know, the average person, even me, like I don't, there's so many players that I don't know who's going to be, you know, the third best tight end coming off the board in round four at that point. So the way that they all talked, all the coaches spoke so highly of him and when they worked with him at the senior bowl and how he's explosive and an athletic freak and all of these different qualities, I was like, wow, if they are this excited about Theo Johnson, I need to be this excited about Theo Johnson. <laughs> We're quite lucky because we have Shane on the podcast, who's a Penn State boy. So he already oh. knew Theo and was quite kind of quite high on him as it was. Okay. Um, so we were lucky in that sense. And and Shane's pretty excited. He's just waiting for that tight end um, number to shake out so Theo can change. I was wondering about that. Do you think he's going to change numbers? Because I feel yeah, like 47 100%. is not great. But... Yeah, no, there, there are a lot of not great numbers on the Giants at the moment. But once the... <laughs> Once the numbers yeah. shake out, I think we'll be okay. Yeah, um, interesting. Right, so we'll go through predictions. It's four quick fire questions. Um, pretty simple. So most valuable giant on offense. Most. Say that again. So most valuable. So... Oh, most valuable, Andrew Thomas. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it, it kind of makes sense. Uh, what about on the opposite side of the ball? Defense. Dexter. Um, surprise package. So the way that I kind of put this to people is Jason Pinnock would have been a surprise package for me last year because I didn't expect a lot at the beginning. And by the end of the season, we were willing to give up McKinney and move him to safety one. That's a good question. Um, I think I'm I'm going to stick with safety and I'm going to say Tyler Newbin because we haven't seen a ton of him so far, but they're so high on him. First safety taken out of the draft. Nick Saban loves him. He was picked really high. Um, so I kind of have high expectations for him, even though I haven't really seen him play that much. But I do feel like once he gets consistent reps, he's going to be really good. Yeah, exactly. We, we seem to be all right at drafting safeties as well. Yeah, even Belton has been pretty good. Yeah, and then McKinney and Landon Collins, if you go back a bit further. Like recent recently, we haven't done too badly at that position. So Yeah, that's a good point. Right, the big one. Team record for the season. My caveat is that everyone has to be healthy because <laughs> I think if we lose Andrew Thomas again, if we lose Daniel, I mean, I, I think we could get by if we lost Singletary, but... Like, if we lose Dexter Lawrence, I mean, so um, assuming that, I think they go nine and eight or 10 or 10 and seven. That's, I feel like I'm, I'm right smack with those two. Um, but if they are healthy, they have to win nine games. There's no excuses. Absolutely. Well, that's it. All done. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, just before you go, let the guys know where they can find you uh, and any of the work that you do. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, I am Adriana. I'm at New York Giants Fangirl on Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter. And then I also have a podcast called Everything New York Giants, which you can find on um, YouTube and wherever you listen to podcasts. But I'll ask you what you what your record prediction is, because it feels like people are all over the board. So I'm curious. Um, I don't know if we've actually done ours as of yet, but Okay. I, I think I'm the same. I'm kind of around that kind of eight, nine, ten win mark. Kind okay. of seems like almost like the safe spot. Now, um, I think this might be the at the time of recording the ninth one of these or the tenth one of these we've done. Um okay. and that seems to be the kind of mean average as well. I don't think anyone's gone below an eight. We've had as high as a twelve. I don't think twelve. Okay. But everyone's going for around the sort of eight, nine, sort of ten, which I think it's interesting because it hasn't wavered since the Texans game. So I think a lot of people are very kind of mindful of it is preseason. Yes, it's not great, but it's preseason. Yeah. And I think to me, nine games is a very fair step up from what happened last year. And I know that Dable is always like, it's a new year. We have new players, blah, 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 which I get. But they won six games 
with their second and third string offensive line, quarterbacks, running backs. Like they had so many second and third string players in that to me, the fact that they won six games is a literal miracle. So I'm looking at it as this year, them being healthy, Dable calling plays, like there's no reason why they can't win nine games. It's absolutely. There's no Absolutely. Well, there you have it, guys. Uh, we hope you've enjoyed this episode. Please do make sure to like, subscribe and all that lovely stuff. I will put both our social links and Adriana's social links in the description below. So make sure you do follow her. But until next time, let's go Giants.